five boroughs of New York City, the largest city in the United States. If it weren't for borough status, Brooklyn would be the fourth largest city in America. And while most people associate Manhattan as the main reason to visit the Big Apple, for those looking for a more personal, unhurried, and soulful visit, Brooklyn is where it's at. It helps when you have jerk across your chest. Mm -hmm. I'm Samantha Brown and I've traveled all over this world. And I'm always looking to find the destinations, the experiences, and most importantly, the people who make us feel like we're really a part of a place. That's why I have a love of travel and why these are my places to love. Prospect Park is a locals park that provides Brooklynites a near 600 acre urban retreat into nature. This park was finished in the late 1800s and it was designed by the same masterminds as Manhattan Central Park, so there are a lot of comparisons of the two. Prospect Park is also where the locals go to get a taste of Brooklyn's top-notch food scene. Welcome to Smorgasburg. Smorgasburg is open every weekend from April to October. It's the largest weekly open air food market in America. So the vendors that I see today, how, how did you choose them? Is there an audition process? Yeah. So like chorus line? God, I hope I get it. More like, <laughs> sort of like chorus line mixed with Shark Tank. I'm Eric Demby, and I'm a co-founder of Smorgasburg. To me, it almost feels like you're going to a cool restaurant, but you're really eating in the kitchen where the chefs are working. You're going and you're talking to the person whose stand it is. And so that's not an experience you get anywhere else. So you wanted to bring something from your uh, your family's childhood yeah. from Hong Kong to here. But we also add what Americans really love, which is ice cream. Wow. It's a good thing I'm not full. Uh. <laughs> This. Yeah. What's a raindrop cake? So this is a jelly dessert. It uh, originates from Asia. It's made out of agar agar. Gelatin is made out of animal products. So this is an uh, alternative to that for people who are vegetarian, vegans, aware. The jelly cake itself is very bland and neutral, but it's also very sort of refreshing. Mm -hmm. And then you add syrups and flavorful toppings like condensed fruit, condensed milk, and different things that just give it the flavors. This is, be it's like almost alive. It's like a jellyfish that you find like in a beautiful tidal pool. It's lovely. Mm. Oh my gosh. That's beautiful. I mean, that's a really, be I mean, that that's, tastes good, but it's like, it's a beautiful moment. <laughs> this is wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome to our stall. This is wonderful. Brooklyn Bounty with the Karachi kick. That's right. Are you from Pakistan? I am, yeah. When did you come here? Um, I moved to the States when I was 18 to attend the Culinary Institute of America. Wow. Yep. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're, you're, you're a chef. I am, I am, yes. My goodness. How did you develop these for Smorgasburg? Did you figure out, okay, what, what do people want? I missed um, Pakistani food so much over here that I knew that there was a niche that wasn't being filled. And I had to be able to present Pakistani food in a way that it was, you know, not not daunting and not as scary sometimes as ethnic food can be mm -hmm. because of the spices, it's overwhelming, because of the smells, mm -hmm. the way it looks. And so I really wanted to make it my mission to kind of, um, you know, take it to the next level where people could look at it and be like, hey, I think I know what this is. Right. And then taste it and be blown away by the flavors. Oh my God, <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> You're not gonna get this anywhere else. So you graduate from one of the top culinary schools in the world. You could have gone anywhere in the world. You could have gone back to Pakistan. Why Brooklyn? I myself really wanted to move to Brooklyn after I graduated culinary school when I moved down to the city. Uh, but my mom sitting in Pakistan had a completely different view of it, right? And she was like, there's no way you are moving to Brooklyn. And I was like, but mom, right? But then she came to visit me and she fell in love with my neighborhood. And now it's like, she's telling her friends, yeah, my daughter lives in Brooklyn. Like, yes, so it's an awesome thing now. <laughs> there aren't many large areas in New York City that are out of bounds for visitors, but this is one of them, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Military ships were built and repaired here for over 150 years. 
but it's now undergoing a complete reinvention as an innovative industrial complex, complete with a brand new historical visitor center, Building 92. Brooklyn Navy Yard, Brooklyn is in the title, but this wasn't just important to Brooklyn, it wasn't just important to New York City, this was important to America, right? How old is, is this space and, and what is it? The Brooklyn Navy Yard was founded in 1801. Wow. Um, and for 165 years it served as one of America's really premier naval shipyards. The first successful steam-powered warship in the U.S. Navy was built here, the USS Fulton. Ironclad ships that became so famous during the Civil War to building the steel battleships of the late 19th and 20th century, including the USS Arizona, which of course was sunk at Pearl Harbor. And then we also, during World War II, built the USS Missouri, which is where the Japanese actually signed the instrument of surrender on the deck of that ship. So we really built the two ships that form the bookends of American involvement in World War II here at the Yard. What amazes me about being here with you today is yeah. just the access we have. I mean, we are here in the middle of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and this was off limits for hundreds of years to the public. The idea was really to raise awareness not only about the amazing naval shipbuilding and ship repair history here, but also to educate people about what's going on here today and the over 330 different companies that are operating here and making things and designing things. Uh, they manufacture chocolate here, I know. That's right. They manufacture coffee uh, already. Is there anything else that they manufacture that we can sort of partake in? Absolutely. So Kings County Distillery, which is the oldest distillery in New York City, and you can also visit. So the funny thing about a whiskey distillery is you make something and then two to four to seven to 12 years later, <laughs> you get to try it. How long have you been doing this? We've been around for only six years, since 2010. So the oldest distillery in New York City. Whiskey even though... distillery? How is that even possible? I would imagine that New York City, I mean, back in, you know, the heyday of the Brooklyn Navy Yard would have had a lot of places like this. Distilling in urban places died with prohibition, but in rural parts of the country, they could just restart those places, go take the boards off the windows and restart. Use so, the bathtub for something else than taking a bath? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so the reason that when we drink whiskey, it comes from rural Kentucky or rural Tennessee actually has a lot to do with like urban land economics during prohibition. And so it's been fun to kind of resuscitate that as an urban distillery one of the great advantages is that you're right next to all your customers. So in the world of cooperage, mm -hmm. the bung goes in the bung hole. Okay. And that is, <laughs> this those is, are this important is family pieces television of a barrel. Yeah, this yeah, right. Sad. Woo, nice, all right. <laughs> Success. <laughs> so you can dip that in there. Okay. And then you're just gonna fill this glass. So this is a rye whiskey. All right. And it's a new whiskey to the world, yes. but it's been sitting here for about six months already. This is at 58% alcohol, so it's a little bit higher than, higher strength than will actually be when it goes into the bottle. You'll notice cinnamon, nutmeg, kind of that peppery rye spice. Wow. What I notice is the alcohol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a that strong too. one. <laughs> so it's barrel proof. So it ages at a higher proof than it's usually consumed. Mm -hmm. So once we take it out of the barrel, we'll add water just to make it more palatable. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for telling me that now. Right, I'm right. totally Sorry. drunk, by the way. One sip. Is there um, something about being here at the Brooklyn Navy Yard that you love? To be at the Navy Yard and to have this connection, especially to American history, helps to tell a story, and that's really part of whiskey culture. Our hope is to connect that broader history and that local history to this crazy product, which is trying to bring distilling back to New York City. Walking through what's considered to be one of Brooklyn's most coveted addresses, the neighborhood of Cobble Hill, which is right next to Carroll Gardens, another gorgeous neighborhood where it's just one, like, man, I wish I owned that brownstone after the next. These neighborhoods are historic, they are handsome, but the reason why I brought you here is for what these two neighborhoods share. Port Street. I love this street because it has this huge collection of shops and restaurants that range from of the moment cool to old school Brooklyn. There are fifth generation pastry shops, pizzerias from the 1950s, and New York's oldest butcher opening in 1917. A life less digitized seems to be the model here where you can peruse comic books, 
walk in off the street and play one of 500 board games, as well as get an authentic Brooklyn drink served to you by a real jerk. I'm Gia Giasulo. I'm the co-owner of Brooklyn Pharmacy and Soda Fountain. I'm Peter Freeman. I'm the head jerk at the Brooklyn Pharmacy and Soda Fountain, and this is my sister. This is my brother. I'm with her. <laughs> <laughs> when we opened up the Soda Fountain, one of the goals, really, of our establishment was bringing the egg cream back to the top of the menu. Mm -hmm. We looked around, and no kids in Brooklyn that we met even knew what an egg cream was. That was our challenge, and that was a little bit of the bedrock of the soda fountain opening, was that we were going to bring the egg cream back to the conversation. So I'm here to learn how to make an egg cream. We're going to make a Brooklyn egg cream. A Brooklyn egg cream? There's a little bit of a difference. What is the difference? A Manhattan egg cream is vanilla. Oh. A Brooklyn egg cream is chocolate. That's the better one. Well, because <laughs> you're, you're in Brooklyn. Oh my gosh. All okay. right. OK, so what so do we need? We're going to start with the right glass. Oh, milk. There's milk in there. Right. Two fingers. Two fingers of milk. Got it. You have different fingers than me. Seltzer. OK. Like, right, because the colder the seltzer, the better the egg cream. Better. Four. So about three quarters of the way. OK. Just so it comes right up to the top. OK, so we're going to put the Fox's u bed in. All right. They've been making syrup in Brooklyn since 1903. This is one finger? One finger, yep. Okay. Two fingers milk. Two fingers milk. One finger chocolate. One finger chocolate. Oh, now what's that? So we stir it, but what we're doing is we're kind of rocking it back and forth. Right. You don't want to beat up all those little bubbles. They're teeny. They can't protect themselves. And that's a Brooklyn egg cream. Nice white head. Chocolatey, but not too chocolatey. This isn't chocolate milk. This was just a little bit of milk and a lot of seltzer. So it's not chocolate milk. Let me see. Oh, that is fantastic. But you're giving more than the egg cream. Just to say it's the egg cream is really simplifying what you've accomplished here. You've brought back a, a proud American tradition. Because when you walk in, there's an immediate sense of falling in love with the space. What you've done is you've created something that isn't overly nostalgic. It's just kind of what people need now. The thing about the soda fountain is that it crosses all ages. You can be two or you can be 82. And you can walk in here and feel like it's your place. Mm -hmm. See, I just give myself goosebumps. Because it actually, it's the thing about the soda fountain that is remarkable. You know, on any given day, there's, a, you know, grandparents with their kids, there are teenagers, and there are tweens that are coming on their own, spending their own money for the first time. <laughs> That's what the soda fountain affords. So is it about the egg cream? No, it's not about the egg cream. But the egg cream sort of represents the revival of the history. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, so it is about the egg cream. So it is about the egg cream. <laughs> <laughs> Founded on three sides by some of Brooklyn's most beautiful neighborhoods, lies an industrial flatland with few trees and one of the most polluted canals of water in the United States. But in a city where everyone is looking to have cheaper rent and more space, Gowanus, a neighborhood you might think twice about before entering, is positioned to be Brooklyn's next big thing. This is the type of neighborhood that I've really grown to have an affection for when I travel because it's not obvious. You have to wander around and really discover it for yourself. But when you do, you'll notice, oh, that looks like a fun looking shop and oh, that's a great restaurant. Oh, there's another one. It's the exact opposite of a major tourism center. It's something that is unique and local. But back to that polluted canal. This is one of the most important industrial thoroughfares in the United States of America and one of New York City's most historic waterways. Really? Really. This is historic. This is extremely historic. <laughs> I'm Joseph Alexia, and I'm the author of Gowanus, Brooklyn's Curious Canal. It is uh, the site of one of the largest Revolutionary War battles in America's history. Is it, that uh, the Battle of Brooklyn? It is, yes, you are right. So this is Brooklyn's Gettysburg. This is Brooklyn's Gettysburg. <laughs> in what cities do you know where there's a natural body of water that goes almost two miles inland? During the 19th century, during the Industrial Revolution, this was akin to having you know, a huge airport in the middle of the city. You could get on and off and go anywhere in the world. You could bring goods in from anywhere in the world. I mean, boats came in from Southeast Asia, South America, mm. India, Europe. This was the biggest port in the United States of America. That was the canal's good old days. And now, for the bad news. It is also an open sewer where in which the toilets of Brooklyn flush approximately 400 million gallons of raw sewage 
every year. I've taken mm. tours around this world, Joe, and I've got to tell you, I've, I've never mm. quite heard someone tell me about the history of a place like you just delivered it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You have a, an affection for this canal. I have a sick love for this canal. I really do. <laughs> um, and uh, it is absolutely, I mean, look, it's bubbling up right I there. As I don't want to look. Not, it has so many mysteries and down. so many stories associated with it. Where did it come from? Why mm -hmm. is it here? Is it as polluted as people say it is? Mm -hmm. How did it get that way? It's endless. Mm -hmm. One of those mysteries might be is it worth a billion dollars to clean up a notoriously toxic canal and even begin building luxury apartments overlooking it? Joe has thought a lot about that. You know, the truth is, I think one of the great things about New York is that we can see the beauty in some of the most hideous and ugly and dirty things. And we're even a little bit proud of that grit that's part of the character that makes New York, New York. This canal is really representative of that in the best and worst of ways. So Brooklyn owes a lot to the Gowanus Canal. Oh, absolutely. Before there was ever a town called Brooklyn, there was a creek called Gowanus. <laughs> Anyone brave enough to open a new business has to ask, what can I bring that you can't get anywhere else? Well, here in Gowanus, one answer is inside this nondescript brick building. Is this a hipster sport I'm playing right now? You know, when we first opened, we got a lot of flack for people saying, oh, it's gonna be this hipster, ironic joint. Mm -hmm. But I think we come by it pretty honestly. We really want people to learn how to play the game. We love the game. I am the 42nd best female shuffleboard player in the world. What? Yeah. Really? So yeah. you compete? Oh, yeah. My oh, gosh. yeah. I was the last person picked for PE, and I am an internationally ranked athlete. So how hipster is that? Not so hipster. I'm Ashley Albert, and I am the co-owner of the Royal Palm Shuffleboard Club. So I've never played shuffleboard before. Maybe yes. like on a cruise ship. It's very hard to be very bad at shuffleboard. Okay. It's very hard to be very good at shuffleboard. <laughs> okay. It's pretty easy to be kind of in the middle. It's like low level exactly. skill. Fun. Exactly. I like that. That's right in my zone. Okay. So this okay. is a tang. This is a tang. Uh -huh. Right down here we have the biscuits, okay. which are what the, we call the discs. Yeah. The whole point is to land in the seven, eights, or tens and not on the line. If it's mm -hmm. even the tiniest on the line, yeah. it does not count. Okay. Whatever's left standing at the end is the winner. And... Oh, wait a minute. No. I have one more important point to tell you, which is that this entire area down here mm -hmm. is called the kitchen, and it's worth negative 10 points. Negative so 10 points. So you want to stay out of the kitchen. OK, so I could actually lose points. You could lose points. OK, so I'm going to step here. Yeah, yep. uh-huh, and then step. Yeah, hey. <gasps> Not bad. Not bad. Well, well, well. <laughs> so when you opened the doors for the very first day, yeah. who came through? Who became your customer? Were you worried? Like, who's going to come to go on? A little bit. We were a little worried. Uh, but we did a Kickstarter campaign. The community really supported yeah, you everybody quite in the everybody in the neighborhoods around this neighborhood, and they showed up, and we had a thousand young, cool people, the kind of people who were paying attention to Kickstarter mm -hmm. campaigns from the day we opened, coming into the club, which was incredible. That's the kind of can-do attitude that can completely overturn the perception of a neighborhood, not only here in Gowanus, but in another section of Brooklyn whose reputation precedes it. My name is Suzanne Spellen. I'm a writer and architectural historian, and this is my Bed-Stuy. Bedford-Stuyvesant is cultural, historical, beautiful, and totally misunderstood. I'm walking down a street right now that is quiet, that is leafy, that is scenic. These aren't usually the words used to describe Bed-Stuy. True. Most people used to say bed sty and they would think poor, crime-ridden, drugs, mm -hmm. police. That's not the bed sty that I saw. 
Suzanne gives wonderful architectural tours of her neighborhood, and we're starting with a great example of a Brooklyn brownstone block. These buildings date from the late 1800s and were built as upper middle class, single family homes. So what we're looking at right now is the Brooklyn brownstone. Right, the quintessential brown stone, which is actually a facade. All of these houses are brick. Oh, okay. And, so there isn't uh, these big brown stones. No, no, these oh. are, are thin slabs, maybe about six inches deep. It was cheap, uh, easy to get, and it was the building material of Brooklyn. Close to 150 years later, it's still the dream to own a brownstone. Yes, it is. <laughs> Yeah, these are classic brownstone stoops. These aren't staircases. These aren't the front steps. This is a stoop. This is a stoop. And life is lived on the stoop. Exactly. People sit on them, watch the world go by, mm -hmm. eat their meals, chat with their neighbors. Mothers watch their kids. You can see the whole block. I feel like it's like the precursor to social media. It's like you talk about someone on one stoop, and then that will get passed down to the next stoop, and right. then so on and so on. It was like it went viral in bed stock. <laughs> just a stoop, yeah, that's stoop true. Driven. So it was really a wonderful example of, of community. There was a time in Brooklyn's history where people didn't care about the old buildings and they leveled a lot of Brooklyn. True, true. How, how did Bed-Stuy survive? Nobody wanted it. it this was the, where the black people lived. Mm -hmm. And so poverty protects protected the buildings from being altered too much, protected the neighborhoods, and um, helped create this wonderful enclave that we have here. So here we are with one of my favorite buildings in all of Brooklyn, the magnificent Boys High School. That is gorgeous. This was a masterpiece not only for the architect who designed it, but it was also a masterpiece for Brooklyn. This was a big show-off building to show that Brooklyn had arrived as a uh, independent city, independent of Manhattan, independent of anybody that had great architecture for public purposes. You know, what fascinates me about Bed-Stuy is that there are two main assets to this neighborhood, the architecture and the people. And they are totally intertwined. They yes, rely on one another. Definitely. And they are here because of each other. I think the neighborhood inspired the culture if you live in Bed-Stuy, you look out the window and every block is a treasure, every window shows something new and different. Another reason why people are making their way to Bedford-Stuyvesant is inside an unmarked brownstone on Macon Street. It's primarily a bed and breakfast, but its parlor is also the proud home of... <laughs> locals to international visitors who just want to play. The music starts at 9 every Friday and Saturday and lasts until, appropriately, around midnight. A traveler coming to Brooklyn is going to find a huge array of diverse offerings. What's happening here is really about people uh, creating, about making things, and about creating spaces that are individual to, to who they are. Brooklyn doesn't take itself too seriously, or maybe it's got a bad reputation for taking itself too seriously, but it takes uh, it not being seriously very seriously. Brooklyn is warmer than Manhattan. Brooklyn is more friendly than Manhattan, but Brooklyn also is where all of New York's attitude comes from. I'm gonna get shot for this, aren't I? Um, <laughs> if you wanna see the real New York, it's really in Brooklyn. When we want to have more diverse experiences, when we want to connect with people and enjoy their effort and their creative spaces, that is when we share a love of travel. And that's why Brooklyn, New York is a place to love.